All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that everybody in the room are investors. And uh, this is all about sharing some best practices. So we have Maya, and we have Jeffrey, and we have uh, Waleed. And first of all, I would love each one of you to say hello to the audience and, hello, and, audience. Introduce, and introduce yourself quickly before we go into the details of the subject, which is the do's and the don'ts when you are scaling your startup. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, my name is Maya. I'm the founder of Ingressive Capital. Uh, I have a very American accent, but I am actually African. I'm half uh, Nigerian, half American, go between Lagos and Cairo. Uh, we have a $10 million fund one, which is fully deployed, and we just are uh, launching, we haven't publicly launched yet, our $50 million fund two uh, that we're actively investing in North Africa from. Woohoo! Um, and we also have a nonprofit that trains about 100,000 African youths a year in technical skills, and we also sponsor computer science degrees, buy laptops and data for African youth who want to learn tech. So, have the fund, and then capacity building through the nonprofit. Thank you, Maya. Mr. Walid. Hi, guys. I'm Walid Bakr, uh, managing partner of Ripple's Impact, which is a boutique advisory firm, mostly on the buyout side. Excuse me. Can, you, can we close the door, please, uh, and let the audience uh, appreciate uh, this session? Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm the second oldest person on that panel, definitely, after one gentleman. And I'm obviously African as well, since I'm from Egypt. Um, and I come from a diverse venture capital, private equity, and investment banking background. So I have lots of sad stories to share that hopefully people can learn from. Thank you. There's always lots of learning. Always lots of learning. Jeffrey, all the way from Canada. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm a general partner for the Supporters Fund uh, and Open People Network. And we are uh, just working on our third fund. And we are uh, a roll-up fund. So we uh, are looking to do acquisitions globally into uh, our portfolio companies. And outside of that, I'm also part of uh, multiple angel groups, invest on both sides. So uh, I kind of like to de-risk everything we do. So I'll invest first and then figure out how to help work through the do's and don'ts <laughs> before the fund comes in because I would rather the fund be really successful. So I'll de-risk it by investing that way. So just another way of looking at things, I guess. All right, thank you very much. So one of the questions that uh, you know, I've been there in the trenches. And by the way, to every investor and to every business central out there, uh, I'm sure if you have entrepreneurship back in your history, I always like to say, celebrate failure. Celebrate failure. A lot of people don't do that. So when you fail, you learn a lot of things, right, Jeff? All right, a question for you. Lesson learned from companies' hiccups in scaling. So the zoos and always the do's and do not. Well, it's an interesting topic because there, there's certainly a lot of things that you can do and you uh, to help build success. And, and I know that when you look at the, the models, there tends to put the negative context that one in 10 will win, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think from a founder perspective, um, a couple of things that I would share that can help you build towards success is when you're going into a new space or an existing market that you're going to be solving a problem with, solve one problem. When you pitch deck, one problem. I think what ends up happening is everybody looks at, I can solve six problems. Well, you will also lose the attention of investors and everybody if you can't solve one. Find the biggest problem and solve that. Um, and then as you kind of start to build the company and go into scale-ups, scale-up mode, I guess, if you want to call it that. That takes years to get to that stage. Um, but find people like these good people on the stage that have invested in categories that you work in or that you are interested in to build your company in. And then befriend them, pick their brain, become a mentor with them, coach everything you possibly can to get as much information out of them and support. This is huge, which means be very open to get and hear the things you don't want to hear. I think we, um, there's a lot of tendencies to shell off and become a builder and forget to coordinate and talk with other people, but I think that's going to help you go through the uh, ups and downs, the ebbs and flows. Um, and then from an investor standpoint, I'm, I'm sure I can give a lot of things that we want to look for when 
uh, beating up a founder to get where we are, but uh, maybe that's on a different question. But I think that those two things kind of really uh, help a founder. And the biggest one, I'll also be the third to add in that is team. Uh, surround yourself with good people that have the same mission in mind, and that'll be uh, very well to help you go forward. Thank you, Jeff. Um, me and a bunch of friends, uh, we sold our last startup in Wi-Fi to Cisco. And uh, what I've learned um, in a humble way is what we call the VSCM uh, framework, vision, strategy, metrics, and execution, the execution part. So now, Maya, what do you think about the do's and don't do's in the two separate journey of an entrepreneur? When you are starting from an early stage, what are those do's and don'ts, and then as they're scaling up? I have a question, quickly for the audience. Uh, who are investors and... They're all investors. They're all investors. Okay, so this is like for you guys to advise your portfolio companies. Correct. Um, and one thing on what you noted about people doing six things at the beginning, what I recognize that is, is a sign that they haven't hit product market fit and their TAM isn't big enough. Because if they could focus on one solution and in the deck show you, look, we can get to a billion dollars, da 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 and it's realistic, they would. So nobody wants to do, have like 10 different lines of revenue and have, their, have, to, have the product have to go through 20 other people before they can monetize it, da 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 That's what happens when you haven't hit proper product market fit. And so when you see that, or when I, I say, do whatever you want, but what I, what I see that as and what I've seen that mean is the founder just hasn't figured out TAM, or they have too many, like from the time they're sourcing the product to the time it's getting in the hands of the end users, there's too many people that are involved in that process. It should just be one, two, three, as in you get the product and you get paid for the product. Or you get the product and you have to have one other party fulfill it and then you get paid for the product. The more complicated it gets, the more likely the founder is to fail because there's that many more variables that you're trying to deal with when ensuring quality for your end user. Um, and your specific question of like starting versus scaling businesses. Um, so we've had, you know, if you guys know the companies in Sub-Saharan Africa, like Paystacks in our portfolio that sold to Stripe and Bamboo and 54 Gene and, you know, um, a ton of other companies. I love all my babies equally. Um, and I can say a couple of the things from starting out and you know everyone says this and then you get distracted because there are a billion and five problems but the unsexy stuff stuff is so fundamentally important so we're just dealing with um, a potential down round in our in one of our portfolio companies and the question of are all the is all the infrastructure in place like do you have all of the legal contracts figured like a standard legal contract for all of your consultants and all of your team members is the esop pool totally clarified does, does each team member know what they're expected to do and like say that they're in the company or out, outside the company, there's no risk of anything happening. Like the unsexy stuff, stuff is so fundamentally important and even within our own fund, um, the legal, the compliance, the structural, the entities, like when you're scrappy and starting up, okay, Delaware entity and we have a sub in these four countries and some of them are tied to the parent company and some of them aren't, but we're moving fast and we'll figure it out later, no. <laughs> When making that investment, that, that needs to be figured out from day one. Thank you, Maya. Monsieur Walid, getting to know you a little bit. You're a techie at heart. You did a couple of companies. You traveled even from Europe to the US. So a question for you. Scaling, what are those don't over my dead body? Don't do those things. What are they, including the go-to-market when you want to go to another country, once you're successful locally. Thank you, uh, Marcel. I think with all the stories of the failures I told you, you said, you know, let, let me ask them over the don'ts rather than the do's. So he knows that more. Uh, I mean, listen, and a couple of, a couple of pointers uh, from, again, from an investor lens, particularly seeing patterns repeat even across venture capital and all the way until leverage buyouts. Um, the first one is the question that's you know popping now, uh, the question of you know hyper growth versus focus on unit economics. And people always believe you know that's something for early stage investing. You'll be surprised. That's something you look at at all stages of a business that you invest in and you want to grow. And you know a lot of people saying, okay, that age of hyper growth focus is over now. It's all about unit economics. I think that's a ridiculous answer because you know there's there's a time and space for everything. 
and and the example that you know I like to tell people is you know if you look at a jumbo jet that's taking off, so typically uh, a 747 when it's in flight it consumes about five gallons per mile when it's flying, but to take off and reach cruising altitude it uses 5,000 gallons just to reach the cruising altitude before it even starts flying. Now. If you think about it, when you focus about unit economics only and not focusing about the gross stage, you're as if you're looking at, okay, how does it cost, how much does it cost to fly, but not how much it costs to go over there. When you look at hyper growth only, it's as if, okay, I'm gonna put enough fuel in there, to take it up there, and then I'm not really sure what's gonna happen if it has enough fuel. And so the point here, even though, because you hear a lot of people, and I heard a lot of people on that stage yesterday saying, you know what? early stage, the art of early stage, don't even bother about you know, looking six months into the future, one year into the future, because you don't really know what's going to happen. It's like, okay, you don't know what's going to happen from you know, a particular number, whether you're gonna make a million dollars or $10,000, you're not really sure. But if you're not really have full understanding of a full cycle of charting the course of where you want to go, you end up focusing on snippets of your journey. And when you plan for snippets of your journey, you don't know what's going to happen next. So I disagree with the notion of let's focus on the first six months and then take it to the next stage when you do the next round. You need to see a map of your journey, but like any map, you know, you're going to come across you know, a, a tree that fell down and blocked the road, so you need to rechart your course. So one of the biggest mistakes in my view that people should avoid of saying it's too early of a stage, let's focus on you know, a short period and then let's take it think forward when you take the next round. I think that's a big, big, big mistake. And you know, there's many cases that we see all over the world now where, where that has led to. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, another thing that's really particular, too early stage, we've seen it at later stage as well, but too early stage as well. Um, and it's a topic not a lot of people talk about, which is teams and founding teams. So usually you have a startup and you look at it's a great team, they came up with this great idea and they are going to deliver and yeah, let's back them up. What people, so, but you know when we look at business, we want to look at the future, you know, six months in, a year in, two years in, what's gonna happen to the business and the market and stuff. A lot of people don't think, two years in, how can these people grow and evolve as well? And if you look at many of the sad, sad stories that happen in the startup space with good companies, not the bad ones that fail early on. Some of the good companies where, as humans, you know, the companies can grow, but as humans, we don't all grow at the same pace. And you end up with situations and that you have to deal with where, you know, the company has grown, but now you have three, four founders who are at complete odds, and you start having to solve the issues between them. I have a company that's really, really successful that had three founders. Three years in, two of the founders, we already asked to step out of the business. So they're out, they wouldn't sell their shares, the company's still doing great, but I now have one founder who's still there, who's doing a great job, but he's completely demotivated because you know, he sees these people that he kicked out still maintaining their shares, we're growing value in the company, and that person is saying, I'm doing everything, and I own like 17% now. Now, so it's easy when you're talking about teams that you can hire and fire, but when you're talking about founders and founding teams, I think people need to do a bit more assessment into the people and how their journey could be in the future and start planning and charting the course for that very early on in the game. Particularly for companies with really strong founding teams early on, because necessarily they're not gonna evolve in the same way as you did. Interesting, interesting. Jeff, um, reality check. Post-COVID, crisis, challenging time ahead. Apparently, there's a lot of gray powder out there, and uh, hopefully, we're here to, you know, or a microscope. Um, question for you. Uh, John Chambers, my former boss at Cisco, we asked him, we said, what was the, one of the biggest mistakes you've done? As an example, he was on a scaling multi-billion, it's not the same scale, but he was humble enough. He said, year 2000, the crash happened, so crisis happened all the, all the time, but for the young people in the room, Remember year 2000, you have been going down. And he said, the biggest mistake I made, I fired a lot of people. So from a scaling perspective, the economy came back and he really regretted that. So coming back to you, post-COVID, crisis-wise, 
scaling. From a founder perspective, what kind of tidbits, advice you can give that founder and the immediate team, CTO, VP of sales, etc., to think through from a scaling perspective because they've already been successful, MVP, proof of concept, customer traction, they are kicking ass against the competition, that this is happening right now, it's a fact. What would you kind of give them as an advice continuing to believe in that scaling? From a do's perspective this time, not the don'ts. Well, you're, the key to scaling is, the, the term should really commercializing. That's what scaling really is. And commercializing means that you've refined your process to sell to a market that you can cookie cutter the process. So it's repetitive. And once you get that going, then you're just adding more people into the fire to keep it rotating quickly, fast, and you're adjusting, and that's what's gonna generate the sales, and then the outcome is how you fix the problems internally to solve all of this. When it comes to uh, tailwinds, issues that are gonna come ahead of you, um, to your point, is there's a lot of planning that goes into this. And I, I think if you peel it back a little bit, is that it's going to be dependent on your core team. And I think you have to realize that as a founder, you have one, two, three, four, five, six people, whatever that number is, of people that will do anything and everything to make the business successful. Those are the people that are your chief of staff. They're the ones that are gonna drive your business. They're the ones you wanna put the money into. They're the ones that you want to uh, do everything you can to make happy. Everybody else on the team are supporting those leaders. They're the ones that are gonna help you push forward uh, and grow that business. If you don't believe in those five, six people, you're gonna have a very tough time scaling your business, you're gonna have a tough time uh, creating process and being able to execute on what you need to do. So take care of those people to start. And then in that planning phase, you should always be planning 12 months ahead um, as best as you possibly can. Uh, when we, I worked in uh, building out e-commerce platforms 20 years plus years ago for the largest retailer in Canada, we had to plan our marketing initiatives 12 months in advance, which seems crazy that I'm in a meeting for something that's gonna happen in 12 months. Well, it sounds crazy, but it's how you execute and it will modify and change, but you're gonna hit in 12 months and that's because you already know what's coming. So in a business, it's planning ahead that helps you execute. It's gonna change as you go and you're gonna refine it. And then if you are hit with post COVID and going into a recession, now it's going to that founder and that founder now can say, I can retool right now. It doesn't mean I'm shutting down. I don't need to let go of everybody else. But what I need to do is retool the process. What do I need to change in order to still have uh, market validation and growth? And I think it's just taking that time to spend with your core team, figure out how you execute. It's going to change, but work with that core team to execute and then talk with people, your investors, and get their point of view as well, uh, if you need to on that side of it. But again, it always comes down to being strategic, planning, and taking input, but also executing with your core. Thank you. Uh, Maya, I'm just going to jump on Jeff when he said scaling is almost equate from the growth of revenue, and therefore, do I need to go somewhere else? You are based in Africa. You know very well the African countries between South Africa and Nigeria, which are a huge local marketplace. And then we go up north, a small country like Tunisia, fantastic technology, AI, you name it, and two different problematic. What would you say from a scaling perspective, the kind of do's and don'ts for that type of landscape out in the African marketplace? For Pan-African expansion? Correct, yes. Okay. Before I answer that question. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on. Um, and one of them is, so within our portfolio, or for, so I'd say the, the founder, the situation of the founders, I'm sorry that they're going through that. Um, again, it goes back to the point from before of like, make sure your legal is in place from day one. Like what, it sounds, I don't think people are doing this as much anymore, but the one year cliff and four to six year vesting, that may sound a little extreme for founders. They're like, no, I want a vesting cycle over two years, but it takes 10 years to get a business to exit. And if you, if you are equally invested, even with our fund, our team members that our employees at the team, if you're getting carry in the fund, you're gonna be there through exit. And so being really thoughtful and ensuring the founders are thoughtful and, and imparting that knowledge. And then also with our portfolio construction, we are 
I don't want to say ruthless, but we are thoughtful about where we invest our resources when it comes to portfolio support. Because there is a very strong correlation between the companies that are not necessarily going to perform and haven't performed or have not found product market fit five years in and those that need the most resources from your portfolio support team. And so being like, as it's investors in this, in this group and we're all coming into a recession when you know, portfolio, portfolios are gonna be having a difficult time, be very thoughtful. Ruthless is a little of an extreme word. Okay, I won't use ruthless. Okay, I used it, cool. Let me be honest about how I really feel. Um, be ruthless in how your team is allocating their resources. We've equally invested in our deal sourcing and, and, and deal closing team to our portfolio support. Like they're, you know, 50, uh, 40 to 40 as far as total fund resources, 40%, 40%. And with that team, we got a fair amount of people with a fair amount of hours, but like the ones that need 30 hours a week from one of our team members are not necessarily the ones that are scaling the, the fastest. Maya, on the scaling for revenue perspective, African countries going to Europe, going to the US, what kind of advice would you give them? I would say um, the two things that we have our portfolio companies do is one, have a strategic investor that has operations across Africa and get them as an early strategic where they can house under the regulation so they don't have to spend hundreds of thousand dollars in each new market that they launch into. And the second thing is not necessarily a strategic investor if you're worried about misaligned incentives and, and all that, but a partner. And so making sure like you as the investor, we have a roadbook or we have a, a, a playbook in each new market where we expand to and say, okay, these are the, these are the incumbents, these are the big players who have um, operations, stable operations, and there's, for example, FinTech licenses in these 10 countries. And these are the areas where they need most help and where they're looking for, for partners. And so if you can, if you can help your, facilitate your companies to plug in there, that's the most seamless way we found to, to rapidly expand across the continent. Like Paystack, like Flutterwave, like how were they in 10, even 54G in some of our companies that were in you know, 10 African countries by their second year, third year in operations, like sustainable with licenses, et cetera. That's how you think about it first. Strategic investors in those markets and you as the investor maintaining those relationships and also having the partners that they can expand with, whether it's banks, whether it's telcos, et cetera. Thank you, Maya. Monsieur Loco, Monsieur Walid, you're based in Egypt, you travel the world. What would be on the same tagline, Egyptian entrepreneurs, uh, business angels, VCs investing in this fantastic, awesome talent that you guys have, and suddenly they're thinking about KSA, they think about Turkey, first from a regional perspective, because they are the three largest marketplace. How about the world? I'm, I'm <clears throat> Um, I'm really being challenged most of the time. I see brilliant idea, be it in Africa, be it in the Middle East, and yet some of them are not thinking global. They're fixing an issue for the local marketplace, but from a scaling perspective, from day one, that particular solution they have, that particular unique technology, it can actually go worldwide. So what would you advise uh, for those do's and don't when you go on a global basis? It's, it's, in my view, it's not a question of advice, but it's because it's rather um, an ecosystem issue. Um, and it's, it's something, funny enough, we were talking about in, in a round table this morning. Um, if you have entrepreneurs that think small, there's nothing that you as a VC can just come in and fix in a meeting or two or a month. It's a whole ecosystem issue. And what people, this is this fantastic uh, book by Greg Horowitz called The Rainforest, and it talks about uh, innovation ecosystems. And one of the great insights is saying, you know, all countries in the world are talking about building ecosystems. Ecosystems are not built. Ecosystems evolve. It's something that you need to put the seeds and you let it grow. And one of the biggest issues that you have with deal flow in emerging markets across the board is that, you know, you sit in Silicon Valley and you sit in a pitch event and you hear about all the crazy ideas that people are pitching about. And it's really exciting. But then you go to the most exciting pitch events in some of our markets and, you know, when people, when you have, like today, when you have three fintech stories, you know, it's like, oh, wow, that's super exciting, but you still have the marketplaces and the e-coms and this world. And I think it's something that you need to solve at the grassroots. Uh, you need to build more awareness venues for people. So, you know, you go, I go to San Francisco a lot, and anytime I go, I don't even plan ahead. I just Google what events, what, you know, seminars are happening on the same day, and I find 20 that I probably want to go to five. You come to Egypt and see, okay, what's happening in Alexandria over the next three months? And probably you find nothing. 
you know, what's happening in Cairo, maybe you'll have two a month, and one of them will be about marketplaces and e-coms. And, and it's something that you need to start developing and sorting out that you need to allow entrepreneurs to start thinking big. I mean, even you talk to entrepreneurs here, people have marketplaces and stuff, but how many companies have you met over the course of two days that are talking about material tech, about AI, about any form of core tech? Very little. And it's something that we need to solve at the grassroots. It's not for us as investors to just come in and fix in a day or two. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not an easy answer, but I mean, we're not here to do easy answers. Correct. Thank you. Well, we have, uh, if we had uh, a couple of questions, because um, people are telling me to be on time, 5.15 is uh, the deadline. So any question for the panel, be it for Jeffrey, be it from uh, Walid or Maya, anybody want to ask a question when it comes to do's and don'ts from scaling perspective? Anyone wants to have a go? No? Monsieur Keith himself. Yes, uh, merci, monsieur. Uh, can it be advice from my team? I'll include myself as my team, but somebody on the, uh, within my team. Um, sometimes when you're talking to a founder and, and they're in a crisis, you want to be able to give them answers, and they're coming to you being like, this is what's happening with my customers, or like we're, we're you know, bleeding revenue into X, Y, Z, and then you want to give them answers where they should go and act. And I sat, I guess this would be my, my fault, is I, we were having these sort of crises. Like when, when the market started to go down, we had calls with, we audited our whole portfolio. We talked to almost, you know, our portfolio is about 40. We talked to all of our companies, gave them a roadmap, checked their cash, do we need to fundraise, do you have 24 months, blah, blah, blah. And um, in one of those calls, someone um, was giving advice to a founder where they didn't really have a lot of sector expertise. Um, I think they wanted to just be helpful and give them the answers. And then, of course, the founder went along and ran with that. And so I would say, as a whole team, I love to say, it's okay to say you don't know, and you're going to find them an expert to bring the answer to them. And so when there is a company that has a problem, don't pontificate, speculate, stick with the, in my situation, I did this, and this is what I can impart onto you. Not, you should do this, I may not have any idea what I'm talking about, but if I'm gonna speak confidently, you're gonna follow my directions. So engaging experts, in the spaces where you honestly have not, don't have the experience. Thank you very much, Maya. Um, I'm going to summarize this. Um, I've been involved, like all of you, as a business angel, and one of the most humbling time, the do's, when we give advice, is to ask the entrepreneur to pivot with the same technology, and that paid off. On that note, could you please, please give a big applause to Maya, to Walid, and to Jeffrey, and thank you very much.